This video is hard for me to make. I am someone who likes to be very private about hard things and things that have to do with emotions. I do like to tell funny stories and make people laugh, but this isn't a funny story. My kidney story or journey started in the middle of April 2020. This was just a couple weeks, three weeks, maybe a month into the lockdown. I had, I had those little signs, but I had no clue that I had kidney issues until they started screaming at me, basically. So I thought I was taking lithium at the time, and I looked that up, and it looked like I was suffering from lithium poisoning. So I called my psychiatrist and said, hey, these are my symptoms. I think maybe I need to cut out my lithium. She said, no, that sounds like kidney failure and you need to get to the hospital right now. We didn't even pack up anything. I just didn't think I was going to be at the hospital long. I don't, I don't know what I expected, but we packed up, went to the emergency room. My husband came in with me and at the, they had a metal detector and I was able to go through and my husband was sent home. That was very hard to be in that hospital all by myself. You know, it was kind of a scary time. Okay, I might not be able to make through <laughs> this. I didn't think I'd be so emotional. It was, it was hard. Mostly because I, I had to kind of do it on my own. I was in the hospital for about a week. I was admitted because of the um, level of lithium that was in my blood was toxic. So I was in the hospital until that was able to drop. And that took a week for it to drop down because my kidneys were just not working. They also took me off of lithium, which is used for bipolar disorder. And then I was cold turkey off of that. So I was trying to deal with not going crazy. And the, I think everybody was scared. The nurses were. So I was left in that hospital room for hours. They'd come in and give me my breakfast, but nobody would come and remove the tray. And it would just kind of sit in my room because I, I wasn't feeling well. I wasn't hungry. And I remember just be sitting there and be like, I don't, I don't want this sitting in my room anymore. And I would take it out to the hallway and put it in the tray where I'd see all the other food trays. It's kind of funny the things that I remember. I, I really wasn't digesting the situation or the motions. I was just kind of like just dealing day by day and hour by hour. My uh, family would call me on my phone and I'd go, I had a window and I kind of told them what I could see in the parking lot and they'd bring the car parked there. They talked to me on the phone and they'd come out with my children and they'd wave to me. I was very scared and very lonely. <laughs> I didn't realize how traumatizing this hospital stay was until like a year later when it was starting to be spring again. And here in Pennsylvania, it just bursts spring. The, the trees get leaves and the, and the grass grows. And I remember when it started to become green, usually that's exciting, spring, and the spring flowers start coming up. And I remember feeling this weight on me, like this impending doom. And it took me a while to figure out that that was the spring, was the time when I was in the hospital, and I, and I hadn't really dealt with that, those emotions. So with my kidney failure, it happened really quickly. I didn't have much time to digest and work through this. I didn't have years to deal with it. <laughs> so part of having this video is to help me deal with all these emotions that I've kind of put off and just just been, you know, I kind of grew up being like when things get tough, you push through. So this video I hope is helpful to somebody else. To those of you who are also suffering from kidney failure, but it's also, you know, helping me. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> getting all emotional. Maybe I'll just cut all that out. <laughs> I did have a um, nephrologist there at the hospital that 
would come in and check up on me. And I remember near the end of my stay, I was getting ready to go home and he came in. I almost want to stand up and show you. But he came marching in, folded his arms and was like, there's nothing wrong with your kidneys. I don't know why everybody's worried. Once that lithium is out of your body, you're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. Your kidneys are going to be fine. And I was like, oh, okay, thank you. And he marched off. Of the, you know, like that was, that was the only interaction I had. And it was a relief because I, I didn't know what was going on, but, you know, I'm, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to go home, recover from this, and I'm going to be okay. But I wasn't. <laughs> the nephrologist was very wrong. When I was able to get home, I had gained 50 pounds while I was at the hospital. That's because they had an IV. They were filling me up with fluids and the kidneys were not able to get rid of that. It was really sad. When I got home, I was so excited to see my kids and my youngest, he wouldn't give me a hug because I just it's like, hi, mom, mom, <laughs> you know, I, I looked so different. Every, every fluid was everywhere. I remember my hands being so swollen that I couldn't like grab things and pick things up very well. Also during this time, I was still, of course, losing a lot of protein. So I was trying to eat a lot of meat and I would eat that and it would make me nauseous and sick and I would throw that up. And pretty soon I was like, I can't, I can't do meat. I can't do protein. It is, it's making me sick. When I got home, I researched all I could about knee disease. And I just watched tons of videos on YouTube and tried to digest everything. And I completely changed my diet. I went really strict, maybe too strict, but I decided not to eat red meat. I also cut out uh, salt sugar and oils. After coming out of the hospital, I was visiting my PCP every other week. And every time I'd go in, I, I would express, I would tell them, something is still wrong. I'm not moving forward. I'm not getting more healthy. I feel like I'm moving backwards. And he would just order a bunch of tests and he'd look it over and be like, oh yeah, that doesn't look too good. He did give me some blood pressure medicine to help because my blood pressure was rising. But um, with each blood test, my creatinine was climbing. I mean, it was just a steady climb. It wasn't like it was steady and a little bump, but just if you, when I look back at my blood work and I can see the chart and it's just climbing up and up and so I'd go back and be like something is wrong and he would just order kind of the same test and be like yeah that looks bad and finally it got um, bad enough <laughs> that he's like you probably need to go see a nephrologist I call the nephrologist and this is of course still kind of during the whole COVID scare and so to get in to see the nephrologist it was four months away and then when I mentioned that to my PCP, that it was like four months away, he's like, oh, that's not good, but I guess you can wait that long. With each of these tests, my creatinine was climbing and finally it got up to 5.3. And my husband called the nephrologist this time. And he was like, look, something is horribly wrong. The creatinine, every time we do a blood test, it climbs. And right now it's at a 5.3. And so they said, okay, okay, we can get you in in September. So that was still a three month wait of me having to deal with this. And, and uh, you know, with my personality, I just kind of pushed it aside. I just pushed it aside and said, we don't, I can't deal with this. I just have to keep doing the mom thing. And I teach lessons. And so I just kind of kept teaching lessons. When we were able to finally make it in to see the nephrologist, the first thing she said after looking at my blood work was, why didn't you come in sooner? It, at the rate you're going, you're gonna end up on dialysis by the end of the year. So she scheduled a biopsy just like a week later. Things started picking up, things were happening and I was feeling like finally somebody is listening. Finally some something is happening and I'm gonna get answers. So she called right away after the biopsy 
and said, you've already lost 25% of your kidneys. They're gone. There's nothing you can do. They're scarred and damaged. And you have FSGS. And I thought, okay, 25% of my kidneys is gone. That's okay. I can do this. We, I can sit at, what is it, stage three. I can do that. I can, I've already been trying to eat really healthy. I can, I can continue to do that. It's going to be okay. There is no treatment for FSGS. So the best thing that they could do is give me steroids. So they started me on a high dose of steroid, steroids, prednisone. And you sit at that level for a month or two, and then you kind of slowly wean off of that. And so when I started on prednisone, it helped quite a bit. And my GFR jumped up to in the 60s, like 68 or something like that. So by July of 2021, my um, creatinine was starting to climb again. And when I went to see the nephrologist, she says, there's, there's not much we can do. There's already not a way to um, treat FSGS. And it looks like you have steroid resistant FSGS. So the next thing that, the only thing left to really try was chemotherapy. And I was on that for about a month and a half. And then at that point, I, that was hard. That was rough. Chemo was rough. I was even taking just a low dose every day. I don't know how people with cancer do that because I couldn't even last on a low dose for a month and a half. My hemoglobin dropped so low that I ended up having to go to the emergency room and getting a blood transfusion. And that would have been some time in October. So talking to my nephrologist now that we knew that my FSGS was steroid resistant and the chemotherapy was no longer going to work for me because my body was just too weak to be able to handle it, we started talking about options of dialysis and whether I'd want to do hemo or peritoneal. And I started studying and looking into that. I mean, I had already been, when you find out that you have kidney disease or kidney failure, you always, you know, you look in at the end result of what might happen. I did ask her, I was like, okay, what can I eat? What can I, what do I need to do to be slowing this down? And she said, there's, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter what you eat. Your body is attacking your kidneys. There's, there's nothing we can do. And, and that made me feel absolutely hopeless because I was willing to put in the work. I was willing to put in the effort and to hear that there was nothing I could do was difficult. And it was a, another moment in my life in which I had to digest and deal with all these different emotions. As you deal with kidney failure, there is a lot of emotions. You have the sadness, the grief of what might have been your future, um, fear, how fast is this gonna happen? You know, like I've never experienced this. I don't know anybody else who's experienced this. So it's very lonesome and it's very scary. But also there's this part of, there's a little bit of frustration and there is some guilt and anger. And so I found that those take longer to deal with than some of the, the sadness. I kept thinking, well, what if? What if I had done this? What if I had changed this? And, and the I should have what ifs were not helpful at all for me. But I still had to deal and go through this. And I was upset that, that my PCP hadn't been more helpful. How long could I have stretched the, my kidneys if I had been able to get in four months earlier? So now the only thing to do was wait until my kidney function dropped low enough to be on dialysis. So again, I was um, feeling very weak. I had less energy every day. There was, I did a lot of resting and a lot of sleeping. I wasn't in really any pain, but it was just so frustrating to not it's important to me to feel useful. So I had to kind of figure out what was important, what did I have enough energy to do, and kind of space that out. 
Another thing that I noticed is my cognitive ability, my ability to to focus on what somebody was saying, if it was really long or if it was going to take some mental work to follow, just I wasn't able to do that. And I, and I think that's partially why I was nervous about doing peritoneal dialysis at home and hemo sounded like a good idea. Now, this is hard to mention, but I do want to mention that I did think about maybe not doing dialysis. I was so exhausted and so tired. It just seemed overwhelming to even do dialysis and to have that port or needle in you and having to experience that. I did look up how to talk to your family if you don't want to do dialysis. So this was a very dark and sad, I was sad, part of my life. I was face to face with my mortality. I did spend quite a bit of time talking to my husband about how I would want to pass away, how I would want my funeral to be. And it also felt very lonely because a lot of this I had gone through during the COVID shutdown and now people were kind of coming out of that, you know, but it's it was very lonely. I didn't know anybody else going through kidney disease or or they did, but they were in like stage three and they would tell me, oh, you don't need to worry about that. You You have years. You don't need to be so strict about what you're eating. You have time. I didn't. I didn't have time. This happened really fast. So in November of 2021, my kidney function dropped below 15. It was down to 10. And I decided to do peritoneal dialysis. I met with the um, transplant team about being on the kidney transplant. And that same doctor was also going to put in my peritoneal catheter. So that happened, I think, just before Thanksgiving. I got my PD catheter in and that surgery was very difficult. Um, if you watched my video on that, it, it was hard. It was hard for me to recover from that. And two weeks later, I started a training and started um, peritoneal dialysis because <laughs> I, I needed to be on it. They had waited till the last moment until my kidneys were no longer functioning. I hope that my story will somehow help you as you journey through this process of kidney failure, that you won't be so afraid, it won't be, it is scary, but I hope that I can give a little bit of comfort and a little bit of relief to know that you can make it through and being able to start and do dialysis. I feel better. I have my energy back. Nothing's going to go back to how it was before you've had to deal with um, this kidney disease or kidney failure, but I am able to have a renewal of life. I think I've softened in ways. I think I've become stronger in other ways, and I'm thankful that I was able to push through and make it, I guess, to the other side of being able to do peritoneal dialysis. So I, I do look at being able to do dialysis maybe a little bit different than a lot of people. I look at it as I'm thankful that I'm able to do it rather than like I have to do it. I think having to deal with this kidney failure and happening, happening so quickly that I am, was able to really see the difference of how I felt before I was able to start peritoneal dialysis and how I feel afterwards. So I hope that you guys out there don't feel alone. I want you to know I've been there. I've felt these, these fears, these frustrations, this sadness, and this anger. And I hope through some of these other videos I can help you process these emotions and these feelings and find fulfillment in your life. You're important. Mm -hmm.